This is Dan and I want to welcome you again to the Napkin Academy and what we're going to be doing is a kind of a vivid review of the complete vivid checklist. The simple idea I want to share with you this morning is that of course a checklist, lots of little check boxes that we can check off as we go, is a great way to remember many steps. Now as I was thinking about this it occurs to me that there are probably two people out there that live by checklists, that use checklists all the time. And one of those people, I think, is probably going to be the surgeon. So let's draw our surgeon here, who's uh, wearing his uh, scrubs. And the surgeon, of course, has got a scalpel in one hand. And over there has probably got some forceps or some other kind of a tool. And the reason is because down here on the operating board, they've got someone who's sleeping, who needs to be operated on. And it's pretty important that the surgeon do everything in order because they really do literally have someone's life in their hands. And the other person, I think, that uses checklists a lot, uh, let's put our pilot here, or in their goggles, and perhaps their oxygen mask, and the pilot, you know, flying their plane, has often got a lot of people's lives in their hands too, and it's critical that they be able to remember everything that they need to do in order. And if you could indulge me for a moment, because I'm a big believer in checklists, not because I've ever done any surgery, but because, as some of you know, I do a fair amount of flying. And I wanted to give you a thought exercise for a moment. But I'd like you to imagine one day that you were going to fly this little plane. And you walked out onto the uh, tarmac, and you approached this plane, and you opened the door, and you got inside, and you sat down. And once you sat down inside this plane, this is exactly what you would see and you'd notice that there are a lot of different buttons, there are a lot of switches, there are a lot of levers, and in a modern version there are a lot of television screens. And you might say, well gosh, I have no idea how I would fly this thing. Well, of course, we know pilots rely on checklists, so I want to show you the standard checklist that is given to someone learning to fly this plane. And it looks like this. This is the actual published checklist, and I used to use this, and I always thought it was terrible because there is no relationship between what I see on this literal list, infinite number of items, and what I remember seeing in that cockpit. What's the association between this and this? And let's get real specific just for a moment. Let's say just to start the engine, what would I do? Well, I'd have to go through all of this stuff, and I'd come, oh, before starting engine and starting the engine. Okay, so it has something to do with what's going on here and starting the engine. So let's zoom in on that for a moment. And here's how I start the engine. My fuel selector to both, my mixture to rich, my carb heat to cold, my master switch on, my throttles open, my propeller area is clear, I prime, I ignition switch, oil pressure, throttle. This is a whole slew of things, none of which actually relate directly to each other in terms of what I'm doing. The fuel selector switch is way down here. The mixture switch is way over here. The carburetor switch is going to be way over here. The master switch is way over here. What's the relationship between this seemingly parallel list and the way that I'm actually bouncing around in this cockpit doing things? So I thought, what would happen if we made a checklist that was more vivid? So this is actually the version of the checklist that I put together, where things are broken down into sections from the moment you walk out to the door of the airplane and open the door. What do you do? What do you do when you get inside? And then how do you go ahead and start and prime the engine? So let's look at how to start the engine in I th what I think is a more vivid type of way. You'll notice that in my checklist I've put pictures of things that look just like the real thing. The master switch, well that's this red switch right over here. The beacon is a, is a light switch that's down here then I've tried to show exactly what you do in context, both with pictures and by clumping things together in sequences that make contextual sense. First, I have to prime the engine. I have to do a set of things to do that. And then I start the engine. I take the key and I start. And then I move my levers, as it shows, until the propeller starts to turn. Meanwhile, I do yell, clear the prop out the window to make sure that anybody who's standing outside the plane moves before I turn the propeller on. So again, a little bit of indulgement, but what I wanted to share with you is there are good checklists in my mind and there are bad checklists. And a good checklist is one that looks like what we need to do. So that we're not just trying to recite a long litany of items, 
but we actually have a visual contextual map of how do those items fit together based on what we really need to do. Now we're not going to be flying anywhere today specifically but we know that in terms of vivid thinking we are kind of flying because we're going from an idea that looks like this and to stretch the analogy we're flying over to this. So we are going to take a little flight and what I want to share with you today is the full checklist everything that we need to do to be vivid to go from that to that. There are three steps there are three essential rules and there are three tools. We're going to move from a land where things are noisy and unclear. We're going to use our vivid thinking in order to generate a truly vivid idea. Now online available to all of you is the downloadable full visual thinking checklist and this is exactly what it looks like. It's available as many of you may know as a PDF and if you haven't downloaded it, I would recommend that you go ahead and go on to napkinacademy.com, log in as an associate, and you'll see just before today's lesson uh, was this PDF which you can download. Now I did this PDF, I created this checklist a long time ago, before we'd actually gone through every lesson individually. And I realized it's a bit without a lot of the context that I li like. So what I want to do with you for today is take you through what initially appears to be a more elaborate checklist but really puts everything into context. How do we use all of our vivid tools? And we're going to walk through this step by step, but the idea is I begin with a rough idea, check. I'm going to do a bunch of things so that I can end with a vivid idea, check. Let's go through the checklist step by step. The first thing that I do when I want to move from a rough idea to a vivid idea is, well, let's zoom in on just this section right here, I think vivid, which means three things. I will create my idea using words and using pictures. My idea contains both words and pictures. And lastly, I can explain my idea to someone else by using words and my pictures. So these sound very uh, redundant, but I want to be clear. I create my idea. My idea contains both, and I can explain my idea using both, both words and pictures. That's what it means to be vivid. So at a high level, the entire vivid checklist simply says, to go from a rough idea to a vivid idea, use words and pictures. Okay, well let's get a little bit more specific than that. Rule number one tells us, in order to use both words and pictures, well why don't we start this way? When we say a word, either in an explanation or a story, let's go ahead and draw a picture along with it. Let's force ourselves to be vivid by being verbal and visual. When we say a word, let's go ahead and draw the picture. Why would we do that? Well, you might remember tool number one was the blablometer. The blablometer is the tool that we use to measure our words to find out if they're being as expressive and clear as we would like them to be. If you're interested in the details of the blablometer, I recommend that you go back to a very early one of our video lessons where we talked about the blablometer in detail. But from the checklist perspective, here's what we need to know. If I want to get into the details of how do I start to move from rough to vivid, first thing I need to do is I need to clarify my idea. How? I take my thoughts and I check it against the blah blahometer. If my idea had no blah blah blah, I need to make no changes. If I found that my idea had one level of blah, that is it was simply somewhat boring, I'm going to use my visuals to help unclutter and sharpen my idea. If I had two levels of blah blah, if my idea was not just boring but also kind of foggy, I'm going to use my visuals to help discover and develop the essence of what it is that I really wanted to say. And if I should find on doing my own self-analysis that my idea appears to have three layers of blah blah blah, where my words are actually becoming somewhat misleading, I'm going to use my pictures to help debunk any lies I might be telling, even to myself, 
and dispel any kind of obfuscation that I've built into my words. In other words, the Bloblometer is our tool that helps us take our initial idea in verbal form and check to see how clear it is, which then brings us to rule number two. If we don't know which picture to draw, because we've just got a bunch of words in front of us, we can look to Vivid Grammar, our second tool, to show us the way. Vivid Grammar, as we remember, is, is our structural tool that allows us to directly translate words into pictures. Here's a snapshot of the Vivid Grammar graph and again this is a tool that is available as a PDF if you just go back on Napkin Academy uh, about halfway through our entire blah 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 lessons you'll be able to download the grammar graph. We certainly learned verbal grammar when we were in school. What the Vivid Grammar graph does is it turns verbal grammar nouns and pronouns, adjectives, prepositions and conjunctions and tense into visual grammar. Now let's look at that in more detail in our checklist. So we use the Bloblometer to determine the clarity of our idea. Now we want to start adding the pictures. So I look through my written idea and I say every time I had nouns I now can draw portraits. Any time I had adjectives of numbers, things about quantities, I now start to draw my charts, my visualization of quantities. Check. If I was using prepositions, this was inside that. That was outside that. That was to the left of this other thing. Ah, that sounds like location. I now start to draw my map. Now what if I, in my idea I used lots of tense? Yesterday something happened tomorrow something else is going to happen. Ah, now I can convert that to a picture by using my timeline. Check. Now imagine if I had really complex verbs. This thing interacts with this thing causing this other thing to happen. Check. I draw a flowchart to show how that verb is structured and what's happening. And let's say that I realize my idea is an entire long-winded verbal argument with lots of pros and cons and data and insights all jumbled together. Kind of an entire argument, verbal argument. Well now I would need to draw a multivariable plot, an X, Y, Z plot containing lots of those things to overlap to actually see what my argument was about. And that's how I use the vivid grammar graph. Rule number three. To make an idea really vividly captivating, we now turn to the most recent tool we've been exploring, the Vivid Forest. The Vivid Forest, as we know, is this set of seven quick steps, sort of seven trees, visual and verbal in the middle, and a series of trees going around that. Form, only essentials, recognizable, evolving, spans differences and targeted. This is what we mean by forest. Once we've taken our original idea in verbal form, we used our vivid grammar graph to turn it into a set of pictures. Now we explore it by going through the forest and come out on the other side with a truly remarkable and vis visceral and vivid idea. The checklist tells us that the way to use the vivid forest is to go through it step by step and start with F. Does my idea have form? Well, let's go ahead and use the grammar graph to make sure that we found the form of our idea. And you might remember, as we were starting to explore form, really powerful idea. Every time I hear a name, I draw a portrait. Every time I hear numbers, I draw my chart. Every time I hear a list, I don't want to hear a list anymore. I want to see the relationship of those things to each other. I draw a map. Any time I hear a story, this and this and this and this and this, I draw a timeline. Any time I hear a sequence, this thing happened, which caused this other thing to happen, which caused this other thing, again, I draw my flowchart. And if I hear a big stew, oh, did you know that this and that and this and that and here's data and here's uh, consequence, I now have to draw my MVP, my multivariable plot, 
in order to show the relation of those. Why have I done this? Because this gives me a very simple way to find the form of any idea that I might have. Now I continue after I found the form. Can I express my idea using only essentials? Well how would I do that? Review back to the distillation curve that told us when we start with our idea we've got an enormous amount of thoughts behind it and they start to come very fast. So our distillation curve tells us we may begin our idea here but we keep working it and working it and thinning it down until we get to just the essence and we present the idea at this point. If other people like it and are interested we can then re-expand the idea with them back to all the details. But we address the idea initially with only the essentials. R. A visual metaphor makes my idea recognizable. The question we ask about our idea is where have I seen this before? Does my idea remind me of a sunny day with, with clouds in the sky? Does my idea remind me of, I don't know, a waterfall? Does my idea remind me of a water wheel? What might my idea remind me of? Does it remind me of a flag? Does it remind me of a game of golf? What is the visual metaphor I can use that helps make my idea recognizable? E. My idea cannot evolve. Two thoughts about this. I want to make sure that I've evolved my idea enough for it to be very complete. I took my original vague idea and I worked it and I worked it until I've gotten something that's pretty tight. But I realize I don't want it to be done because I want to leave something for my audience to bring to the idea to be able to add to it to make it their own. S. Does my idea effectively span differences? The thought being have I really only presented my idea as one half of an equation? Well what about the whole? And how do I do that? Refer back to the vivid stretch test which says if my idea is X and I want to make sure that I can stretch it as far as I can to make sure that it's really including things that might not be X. I have to look for an opposite and see if I can integrate it into my idea. Very conceptual, but the stretch test goes back to when we talked about spanning differences. And lastly in my checklist is my idea targeted. I look at my audience through the lens. The lens of course being the tool that we've talked about the last couple of sessions, the little mnemonic that tells me who is my audience leaders, experts, number people, sympathetic people, or the opposite. Leaders, doers, experts, newbies, number people, emotional people, sympathetic people, antagonistic people. And if I've gone through that and looked at my idea from all those perspectives, I know that my idea is truly targeted. And that really is the summary of everything that I wanted to share to with you today. We're going to go back and let's look at the checklist one more time. The entire vivid checklist looks like this. Let's work it one more time. I'm not saying that every time we have an idea and we want to make sure that it's really vivid, we need to do every single one of these steps. But I am saying that if we begin with a rough idea, and it is very critical that that idea become vivid and clear to us and to other people. We have this entire checklist available to us. It's worth running through as much of it as we can and saying which of these buttons do we need to push in order to help us move this idea from here to here. Why would we need to do this? Using the vivid checklist helps us go from an idea that looks like this to an idea that looks like this. Using the vivid checklist helps us go from an idea that reads like this to an idea that looks like this. Using our vivid checklist helps us move from an idea that looks like this to an idea like this that then allows us to turn that idea into something like this. And why would we do this? Because following the vivid checklist allows us to move from a world that looks like this to a world that looks like 
this. We understand our idea. Everybody else understands our idea. We've taken our rough pile of coal and we've turned it into a diamond. And now we're going to have a little bit of time to review some of our student work. Great homework from last time. The assignment was to exercise one last time the vivid forest by taking an example of one of these two sort of moralistic statements, either it's better to give than to receive, or the best things in life are free, and to illustrate your thoughts using any three letters of the vivid forest. So Barbara, I'm turning on your microphone now. You should be able to hear me. Yes. Hi Barbara, how are you? Thank you, I'm fine. <laughs> Could you uh, walk us quickly through your picture and, and uh, explain it's better to give than to receive? Yes, first of all, I, sh I should probably uh, say that. I was looking uh, a little bit where this idea come from, and I found uh, that it might be uh, the saying of Jesus, as reported by St. Paul in the New Testament. But I also found uh, that there is uh, something about this idea in the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle and uh, of course there are some uh, modern scientists now who confirm uh, this idea with uh, new theories so because we enjoy it very much that what we have and what we can share with others and that is that is why we it is better to give than to receive lovely Barbara, can you walk us through from the pictorial perspective, starting at the middle with the form of that idea? Yes. So I, I was drawing, first of all, two persons, and there's the one person who gives something, or you see a sort of a plant, uh, uh, probably a seeding, and this person is, uh, uh, is very much smiling, he has a large smile, and the other one who is, uh, is well, he's also there, the one who is receiving, but he is a bit, lit, a bit, uh, a little less involved. Wait, I, I tried to to take some of the letters of the forest, and I tried, um, uh, first of all, um, only essentials. The hands of the one who is giving, uh, hands opened, opened up with a heart, and that I, I liked very much. Actually, this is the one I, I, I like most of all. But then I I, th I thought I could get this idea a little bit in evolving, but because it could be everything what you like that you could give. I, I, I started to, to find another um, image representing that all what you can give, and I found this idea, um, uh, the horn of plenty. <laughs> That's what yes, yes exactly. Up. And then I, I thought that probably the horn of plenty is, had some people uh, um, carrying this horn of plenty. Well, I, I, I went back to my initial idea and I uh, just took out of extracted um, uh, the one person uh, with a plant with a little seeding and I just multiplied uh, this person and, and uh, then I tried to merge uh, this uh, this idea and I, into a symbol it's in the middle there the, the person and they um, take or share uh, these flowers a little bit oversized unifying them and Barbara, that's lovely. That's a really sweet drawing. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, John, I'm going to ask you to follow up on Barbara's lovely work. And John, let me uh, tee up your drawing here as well. And John, you started out with uh, something taken, I think, from the First Amendment. So, John, take it away. Good. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, Associates. Um, the, the American proverb I wanted to work with was the second of option, which is the best things in life are free. And uh, I just want to quote um, Noah Webster of Webster's Dictionary fame. He said, a constitution is an agreement that sets in place a system of fundamental principles for the government of rational and social beings. And those two words, rational and social, reminded me of the, the fox as our rational brain and our social aspect as the hummingbird aspect. And when I first started this, um, you can see I've got the, uh, the form or the essential image on the bottom right of the Statue of Liberty. But for a couple of days, the, the idea that was going through my mind was a caged hummingbird. And I was thinking, well, how can I create this uh, a visual metaphor around a, a bird cage and a hummingbird? But, and then I said, OK, let me work with these, the fundamental principles of, of freedom in America. 
And so you see these five statements, and I thought, okay, how can I work the hummingbird and the, uh, the caged metaphor? If we go to the next graphic, uh, you'll see I actually didn't use the caged metaphor, but I took these five freedoms and I thought to myself, okay, the best things in life are free. And stretching this vivid idea, I, I just made the comment, yes, they are, they are free if you're willing to pay the price. So I took each of these fundamental freedoms, firstly the freedom of religion, and you can see it's been expressed not as my religion or one religion, but multiple religions, which really is the essence of the freedom of religion in the United States. And then you'll see my attempt at putting some handcuffs uh, beneath the, the, the open hands. When I move to the second image, the freedom of speech, uh, you'll see, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I'm explaining these images, I hope they're self-explanatory, but you have an individual whose speech is impeded or prevented. So clearly, uh, the freedom of speech in this, the example of this illustration requires a, a price to be paid to exercise it when unpopular things are said. Uh, the third aspect, or the, really the third fundamental freedom, is the freedom of the press. And again, I'm, I'm hoping the image uh, captures the essential aspect of press freedom, and it, it has the association of censorship and not being allowed to read things that are, that are freely available or should be freely available. The fourth image, uh, certainly very graphic. Uh, we have a, the right of people to peaceably assemble, or the right to peaceable assembly, and. Uh, there are aspects of when we exercise that right that it may uh, infringe certain laws, and so I'm, I'm hoping that that image uh, again extends the uh, the image of freedom to a point where we really have to think about what it, what does it mean to exercise our rights, and what does it mean when those rights are prevented from being exercised. The fifth and final petition is the petition it is our right to petition government for the redress of grievances, and uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to comment on the images. I'm hoping that at this stage, uh, the, the, the essential essence in the form speaks for itself. The central image, uh, rather than being a caged bird, which had the, for me, the connotation of, of sadness and the desire for liberty, um, you know, liberty itself, our statue of liberty, best expressed the image. And I just completed the, I synthesized these five images with the statue of liberty, liberty and just the, the face of liberty. And a, a final thought, um, trying to, to merge these together, this is the really the, the hummingbird uh, expression of freedom, but the, the fox might come back and say that really the, the Constitution lays out the rules of the game for those who want freedom for themselves and those who want freedom for others. Wow. Well, John, as usual, very, very thoughtful work. I think this has given uh, a, a remarkable vivid aspect. To, I'm going to back up here a little bit because what I really appreciate about what you've done is the First Amendment says these things and for people who've been through grade school or grammar school uh, of course very often we memorized the preamble to the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or some of the amendments to the Constitution but I often think that having memorized simply the words doesn't I know reflecting from my own experience memorizing the words does not mean that I know what they mean and I think that what is the exercise that you've exemplified really well here is that thinking through the words, trying to identify what might be the visual and vivid way to express them, in my opinion, forces our mind into a way of looking at them more clearly and saying, I really do understand what they mean. So, John, I, I absolutely appreciate the thoughtfulness you've put in because I think you've, you've very, very well uh, represented exactly what I try to encourage by going through the entire vivid checklist it's not enough to simply say something we have to be able to visualize it as well and I think that the vivid checklist provides us a backbone for how individually and in groups we can go ahead and do that so John again you thank you for your work. Thank you Dan. Hey thank you all for another great lesson this is Dan signing off from the Napkin Academy but don't go away now on our new platform you can still submit your homework Debbie, our community manager, is going to join you right now to show you exactly how to do that. And I really encourage you, do your homework. Okay, take it away, Debbie. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this Napkin Academy classic video. We've made it easier than ever to share your homework. After you've completed your homework and have a JPEG or PNG file saved on your computer, come back to this course. Once you're back here, scroll to the bottom of the screen. And in the comments box, you can add a comment. I'm just going to call this one my homework. 
You can also add images by clicking on the Insert Edit Image button here. In the source box, click on the file. In the images window, click on Upload. And then click on Add Files. This is going to take you to your computer where you can search for your images. I'm just going to search for mine in pictures. And I'm going to choose this image here. You can also add multiple images here. Click Upload. After the upload is complete, click Close. Then scroll down. And you'll see that the last image is here. And it's checked. This is the one we just uploaded. Click Insert. I suggest in the dimensions box you change the maximum to 1200 pixels and leave the constrained proportions box checked. You can also add an image description here if you'd like. Click OK. You'll see that your image has been added to your comment. And now the last step, the most important one, make sure that you click the green comment button here to upload your homework to the Napkin Academy. We hope to see your homework soon.